All right, our next uh, speaker is also incredibly inspirational. Um, <clears throat> as, a, as a policy and advocacy associate, Arturo leads aspects of the National Immigration Forum's immigration reform work, focusing on the visa system. And Arturo has an extensive practical experience in the field of immigration, working as a legal fellow at Cornell's uh, Farm Workers Legal Assistance Clinic, as a visiting scholar at Columbia's Constitutional Court, as a research fellow at the Human Rights Watch, and as a policy consultant at the Organization of American States. And I'm very honored to inform you that Arturo became the first Mexican graduate of the Doctor of Science of Law, the JSD from Cornell Law School in 2020, and I was on this committee. And uh, after defending his brilliant dissertation, which was entitled, The Right of Suffrage of Show Six Non-Citizens in the United States. Um, he is a remarkable human. Uh, so please welcome one of my favorite former students, Arturo Canales. Thank you so much for your kind words, Derek. And let me show you a presentation that I have uh, made for you today. Um, here it is. Can you see my screen? Uh, I don't see it yet. Give me just one second. Let's make sure we get it so people can see it before we get started. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. Does it allow you to share? Yes. Okay. So I think it's it's ready. Oh. I see your blue screen now. You see my blue screen. Okay. I see like a, a blue screen with some icons at the bottom. Ready? Sorry about that. Can I just one second? No problem. No worries. Now's the time when I unmute and tell some sort of a joke. Ah. Uh, Distract people. Do you have a joke? Uh, no. <laughs> That's the joke. I don't but know. It, why would the tree, why would the mushroom not go out with the tree? Oh, yeah, because he wasn't a fun guy. Yeah, exactly. These are my bio jokes. But um, bump. <laughs> there, there we go. go. We there we go. It. See? Yeah. All right. Give me just one second. No problem. Um, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to uh, be back in the best university in the world, even if it's just virtually. Uh, Cornell is by far my favorite place on earth. It has a very special place in my heart for many, many reasons. Uh, I am even wearing my Cornell cufflinks as good luck charms for today's presentation. Uh, so I want to thank the Cabreras, all of them, Derek, Laura, Elena, Brittany, for bringing me back to my alma mater and organizing the largest systems thinking conference to date. I mean, 1,800 people, man. well, congratulations. And thanks for inviting a lawyer to your conference. I know people don't like lawyers because we always turn fun and interesting stuff into something awfully boring and legalistic. So with that in mind, let me make a, a disclaimer. I promise it will be the only boring thing that I will say during my presentation. And uh, to ease you that pain, to help you ease that pain of my legalistic remark, I will leave you with a photo of my of the of, of Patch, which is our family dog. Uh, while I say that the views and ex opinions expressed in this presentation are personal and do not necessarily reflect the position or views of the National Immigration Forum, where I work in Washington, D.C. Okay, see, it, it wasn't that painful, right? Um, but the organizers didn't invite me to bore you to death or show you, uh, or show you pictures of my dog. Um, I am here to talk about a distinction made within the electoral system of the United States that leaves around 22 million people without the right to vote and hold office in this country. I am talking about show six, commonly known in the United States as non-citizens, but please remember that word, show six. 
And before explaining why Shosik is a critical distinction within the US electoral system, let me start this as a prelude uh, with a story of why I decided to spend four years of my life reading, writing, and studying about show six. Uh, so let, here we go. My wife and I, we immigrated to the United States in 2016. Uh, and we chose this country because it felt like a very welcoming nation to us. Uh, actually, I met my wife thanks to a, a brilliant and inspiring speech that Barack Obama delivered in Mexico City for Mexican students back in 2013. Uh, in his speech, my goodness, it was one of the best. He, he made jokes, he spoke in Spanglish, uh, he quoted Mexican authors, and he also encouraged Mexican students to work hard to achieve their dreams. So following President Obama's advice and attracted by the global prestige of, of American universities, we decided to chase our dreams in the United States. And when we first arrived to Ithaca, New York in 2016, we, were, we, we felt happy, confident, and we were full of hope. Uh, honestly, we felt eager and ready to, to jumpstart our professional lives in the United States, uh, ready to conquer the world. Um, little did we know, however, that a few months later, the US presidential campaign would dramatically shift the rhetoric and conversation against Mexicans like ourselves. I mean, he who, he who must not be named turned our hope into fear and our happiness into sadness. Uh, just imagine in the rally where he announced his intentions to run for the US presidency, he called us uh, criminals and rapists. And uh, he had, a, he had constant, uh, constant betrayalic remarks, not only against Mexicans, uh, but also against Chinese, uh, Muslims, transgenders. The, the list is long. And um, as the great Rubius Hagrid would say, it was dark times, Harry, dark times. <laughs> and, and Donald Trump's remarks permeated to all political levels of the United States. State elections became more hateful, uh, contentious, polarized. And the same thing happened in counties, city, village, and town elections. Uh, well, even school board elections became political battlegrounds. And in the middle of that polarization, I felt awfully frustrated by the fact that even though I was a politically active and informed resident of the United States, I had no right to vote in any of those elections. Uh, luckily, I was in the best university in the world, surrounded by the best minds in the country, and they encouraged me to turn my frustration into action. So they motivated me to write a doctoral, a doctoral thesis uh, about whether non-citizens should have the right to vote in the United States. And to answer that question, I spent four years of my life reading endlessly. Uh, I traveled abroad, I engaged in debates, uh, I pulled all-nighters just to answer a simple question. Should immigrants be allowed to vote in the United States? My answer after four years of intensive research was, it depends. I know you may be disappointed. You may think, oh my goodness, he spent four years to, to find an answer that is just two words long. It depends. Uh, I understand, I understand, but please, please bear with me. Uh, but the reason why I'm here today is because in my quest to find that answer, uh, I was introduced to systems thinking. Uh, its theory blew my mind from the very first moment and its practicality was, was out of this world. So I started treating it as gospel, honestly. So let me tell you how systems thinking guided my doctoral research about the right of suffrage of residents of the United States who are not American citizens. As you will see, I will have to make, I, I had to make uh, distinctions. I had to appreciate the complexity of the electoral system. I had to understand multiple relationships and I had to adopt different perspectives to find that answer. So in that regard, in today's presentation, I will first address the linguistic distinctions that I had to make to discard all the problematic labels used to refer to residents of the United States who are not American citizens. And I will explain how I coined the term Shosik. Then I will talk about the strong relationship between Shosiks and the United States. 
as we will see, show six are essential economic, demographic, uh, social agents of this country. After that, I will briefly discuss uh, my findings on who constitutes the demos, uh, the people within a democratic system, and whether show six should be allowed to vote uh, and hold office in the United States. Finally, in today's presentation, I will address the perspectives in favor and against of granting the right to vote to non-citizens. And of course, I will explain my own perspective and tell you why I came up with the answer of it depends. So let's start with the linguistic problems, all right? Um, you have to understand, when I first started my, my research on Shosik and franchisement, I felt uh, uneasy reading and writing all the labels used to describe residents of the United States who are not American citizens. Aliens, immigrants, foreign nationals, expatriates, uh, non-citizens. And you have, I mean, you have to understand that language is to scholars what balls are, are to footballers, right? So to soccer players. Language is our instrument of work. And in this case, language was perpetuating the stereotypes and negative connotation of this group of people. And for this reason, I devoted a big chunk of my research to explain why the labels that are employed to refer to residents of the United States who are not American citizens are problematic. So before I continue, I have something to confess. Uh, it's important for you to know that I am an alien. Um, I am not from another galaxy or solar system. I am from Mexico, I was born in Mexico. Uh, however, according to American laws, those of us who are not American citizens or nationals are aliens. And for many of us, I mean, the label alien is demoralizing, right? An alien is someone from another planet, someone that is not even human. Uh, alien um, additionally is a noun that is, is a noun and an adjective used to describe someone or something that belongs to another place. Aliens may have foreign passports like myself, but we belong to the place where we reside, where we live. So for such reason, I decided not to use the word alien in my research. Now let's discuss the, the term immigrant. Um, immigrant is not wrong, but it is not precise either. Uh, and it is, it is imprecise because every non-citizen is an immigrant, but not every immigrant is a non-citizen. Immigrants who become naturalized American citizens will always be immigrants regardless of their new citizenship status. Take for instance, the case of, of Albert Einstein, who was an immigrant from Germany, who became naturalized American citizen. He was a citizen and an immigrant at the same time. So he had the right to vote. So for such reason, I do not refer to resident non-citizens as immigrants because it would not be precise. Uh, also, uh, the, the other term is expat or expatriate. Um, and that term is imprecise. It's an imprecise label, particularly for two reasons. First, because the country of origin or, or patria in Latin should be an irrelevant voting qualification in most of the electoral jurisdictions of the United States. It should not matter if a person holds a foreign passport when voting in municipal election, in, in municipal elections, at, at least that's my opinion. And besides, we often use the label expatriate in a classist and perhaps racist way that makes it unsuitable for this research. Uh, if you browse on, on, on Google images, uh, the word expat, you will only find big, big, big pictures of either successful young people dressed to the nines uh, or re retired white people enjoying life in sunny destinations. If you search immigrant in, on that same browser, you will find photographs of non-white persons defend their, their most basic human rights. So that is why I decided to avoid using the word expatriate in my, in my, in my research. Then foreign nationals. Uh, foreign national is only an appropriate label when nationality is an essential suffrage qualification. Uh, as we will see in the next minutes, there are multiple electoral jurisdictions in the United States. And in most electoral jurisdictions, including school board elections or municipal elections, Nationality seems to be an irrelevant voting qualification. Therefore, uh, I decided to avoid the label foreign national because it would be inaccurate, right? And finally, I also decided to, to avoid using the popular label non-citizen. 
And I don't use it for two reasons. First, the prefix none of the root word citizen creates uh, unnecessary confusion. Uh, for almost a century in the United States, only citizens have been able to vote and hold office in the country. Uh, hence, when we refer to the right to vote and hold office of a non-citizen, it seems like a linguistically absurd proposition, right? Uh, citizen, citizenship and enfranchisement are two concepts so indissolubly ingrained in our brains that referring to non-citizen suffrage sounds as incompatible as non-alcoholic tequila. Right, it does not exist. Uh, so the same thing happens with non-citizens. And second, in logic, it makes sense to label something for what it is not. For example, if we consider the logic statement, uh, you are either A or B, the negation of A or B becomes not A or not B. Uh, however, the, I'm sorry. However, using negations in, in the law, in debates, or even in daily conversations uh, creates unnecessary confusions and complications. When we label something for what it is not, we're limiting expressiveness, expressiveness, vocabulary, comprehension. Moreover, the English language has over 1 million words and grows at a pace of 1,000 new words per year. That's why. Um, I thought it vital to create a new pertinent label for the group of people subject to my study. Yeah, and that label is Shosik, right? Shosik. And the word Shosik is a new word inspired by the ancient Roman nuances of citizenship that I describe in detail in my research. Uh, Shosik is a semi acronym for the Latin suffragio et honorum sine civitas which means the right to vote and hold office without citizenship in Latin. And I define Shosik as a person who has the right to vote and hold office in their place of residence, despite not possessing the citizenship of their country of residence. So as you can see, my research focuses on the almost 22 million Shosiks who live in the United States who pay over $300 billion in federal, state, and local taxes, whose households earn around uh, $1.5 trillion, which gives them significant spending power that helps boost local economic economies. Show six are also essential to the religious, cultural, gastronomical life of the United States. Um, just, just Think how boring gastronomy of the place where you live would be without, without us, without show six, right? Uh, for those of you who are watching from, from Ithaca, I don't know you, but I survived the Ithaca winters thanks to the Vietnamese pho, Korean soups, uh, Thai curries, um, you know? So very essential to the, to the life of, of, of the country, of the places where we, where we reside. Um, show six are also subject to the same loss um, to the same loss of uh, as American citizens, we're affected by the same policies adopted by elected officials. Uh, some of us can enlist in the in the American Armed Forces. Some show six can serve as first responders in the in, in some places of the United States. Some of them are parents or spouses of American citizens, and uh, some others, I mean, have lived in the United States longer than they have ever lived anywhere in their entire life. They belong to the United States. And despite all of this, they are not allowed to vote or, or hold office simply because they are not American citizens. And you have to understand uh, the fundamental reason for worrying about the democratic exclusion of show six is that public authorities often neglect people without a political voice, uh, many, many rights, right? Uh, people who ordinate political avenues to voice their concerns are not as successful in attracting the attention of mayors, sheriffs, uh, district attorneys, school boards, governors, uh, presidents, legislators, judges. So uh, people without the rights of suffrage generally end up with uh, lower quality of life, lower quality of public services, and many other legal resources provided by the state. And the democratic exclusion uh, of show six is problematic nationwide because show six represent 7% of the population of this country, 7%. And 
their percentage is even higher in certain states compared to the national average, such as in California, where 13% of the population is show sick. Uh, in Texas, it represents 11%. In Nevada, New Jersey, New York, show sick represent 10% of its population. In Florida, it's 9%. So, and, and when we break down those states into congressional districts, uh, the, the, the number of show six incre increases dramatically. Uh, in California's 34th congressional district, for instance, three out of 10 residents are show six. In Texas, 29th congressional district, one out of four. The same thing in Florida's 25th congressional district. Uh, so we must pay attention to this democratic deficit in the United States. And such a profound problem was particularly shocking when I traveled to Kern County in California with Cornell's Farm Worker Clinic back in 2017. Uh, for those of, of you who don't know, Kern County is the country's largest producer of grapes, second largest producer of almonds, third largest producer of citrus, um, and one of the largest producer of pistachios, right? And as you can imagine, the, 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 the economy of the county depends on, on, on agriculture. Uh, $7.2 billion, uh, it creates, it generates $72 billion every year. And of course, uh, Kern County has historically attracted Mexican immigrants, both documented and undocumented, to work in the fields. And this workforce has been essential to boost the local economy and has impacted the, the demographics of, of, of Kern County, uh, where the majority of the population is Hispanic. And despite having a majority, uh, having a, a, a Hispanic majority population, uh, and, the, and despite the evident contributions of this group of people, I was surprised to find out that Caucasian candidates, who in many cases had a firm stance against immigration, were significantly more likely than Hispanics to win elections and hold elective positions in Kern County. And many of those elected officials had premises to, to combat, and that's why the, the word they used, to combat migration, even though their salaries depended directly on the Mexican workforce on, on, on immigrant labor uh, of both undocumented and documented workers. And so this made evident that preventing show six from the right to vote, just because they are not American citizens, created a, democrat, a, a democratic deficit in the United States that was worthy of study and analysis. Uh, two centuries ago, it's, it, it, it may have seemed absurd to discuss the voting rights of women. Uh, today, there might be people who think that enfranchising show six is a ridiculous and overambitious proposal. Nonetheless, I believe that my dissertation helped to catalyze a debate that is already taking place all over the United States. Uh, to be honest, the movement started more than a decade ago in, in some municipalities of Maryland. But it is now subject to debate in New York City, uh, Chicago, San Francisco, some places in Massachusetts. So with all that in mind, let's go back to the question that guided my research. Should immigrants be allowed to vote in the United States? Right. As a fervent believer in systems thinking, I thought it was critical to identify the different perspectives around the right of suffrage of show six. So let me share with you some of the main arguments that I have identified against show six right to vote and hold office in this country. I'll start with the most recent argument I heard. Um, on December 9, the New York City Council passed a bill that would allow more than 800,000 New Yorkers show six to vote just in municipal elections, right? Just in New York City. However, uh, one month later, the Republican National Committee filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the bill, arguing that, and I open quotations, American elections should be decided by American citizens. And I would like to, to know what you think. Are municipal elections, as proposed in the New York City bill, indeed American elections? If you think they are, then I guess only American citizens should be allowed to vote. If you think, however, that municipal elections are precisely that, municipal elections, then municipal residents, regardless of their citizenship status, should be allowed to vote. Uh, that administrative division is what makes the United States a federal republic. 
uh, rights. Um, other arguments point out that Shosik enfranchisement would violate the principle of self-determination of the United States. Um, some people worry that allowing foreigners to vote in the United States would be an opportunity for foreign powers to intervene in American politics. Uh, my proposal, however, and that of New York City, is that only people who have been vetted one way or another by the US government should have the right to vote. Furthermore, local elections play little to no, relevant, little to no relevance in geopolitical relations, right? In these elections, voters vote for people to fix the potholes, to pick up the garbage, to modernize the parks. So uh, their, their significance in the international arena are irre almost irrelevant. Uh, others argue that show six who do not speak English should not be allowed to vote. Understandably, some American English speakers might feel uncomfortable sharing the right to vote with people who do not speak their language. Nevertheless, it is essential to point out that English, first of all, is not the official language of the United States. It is the most spoken, but it is not the official language of the United States. Um, additionally, most show six in the United States do speak English and do understand the language. And those who think otherwise are failing to recognize the many different types of show six in this country. Uh, moreover, if English were a prerequisite to vote in American elections, that would be in open discrimination to the deaf people in the United States who speak through American Sign Language, ASL, not, not English, which is different. Um, also, there are some others who argue that enfranchising, enfranchising show six would shift the political center of gravity to the left because of the influx of these new voters, right? However, those who employ this argument fail to recognize the multiple types of show six. We cannot place shows, we cannot place all show six in the same political basket. Some of them have liberal ideologies, while others lean toward conservative agendas, right? While it is true that the proponents of show six enfranchisement tend to be progressive, like myself, show six do not necessarily mirror that ideology. Uh, and arguing that show six are all liberal just because the advocates of show six enfranchisement are progressive is as fallacious as assuming uh, that all the LGBT community is liberal just because the advocates for the right for the rights are progressive, right? Some show six come from very religious countries. In many cases, their first identity is their religion, not their ethnicity or nationality. So contrary to what many people think, enfranchising show six could potentially shift the political center of gravity to the right and not to the left. So it's something to consider. Now, let's move to find out what groups of people have been historically considered participants uh, in, in, in the electoral system of the United States. My research from the very beginning raised a fundamental philosophical question um, about, about democracy. Who constitutes the demos, the people? in a democracy. In the United States, the requirements to vote and to hold office are fluid and, and continually changing. Uh, since settlers arrived in America, the qualifications of the electorate have evolved to adapt to the economic, social, political, and demographic development of the country. Uh, the history of suffrage in, in this country is clear evidence that voting qualifications are neither perpetual and nor uniform. They keep changing to adapt. And far from, being carved, far from being carved in stone, they frequently shift left or right to broaden or narrow the demos in the country. In the history of the United States as an independent nation since 1776, the country has experienced five enfranchisement waves that granted suffrage to large portions of the population. Most propertyless white men were enfranchised during the first half of the 19th century. Then, um, came African Americans after the Civil War, then women in 1920, then uh, again African Americans in, in, in the 60s, and finally 18 year olds after the Vietnam War. Now, you will be surprised with, uh, well, I'm, with what I am about to say, uh, but believe it or not, for most of America's history, the right to vote has, been, has not been an exclusive prerogative for American nationals. 
Shosex have been allowed to vote in 33 states of the country, 33 states. In other words, Shosex were, were able to vote in two thirds of the 50 states of the union for 148 years between 1776 and 1924. That period of time represents 60% of America's history as an independent nation. Also, it is essential to highlight that as of this year, show six in the United States are allowed to vote in a few municipalities in Maryland, Massachusetts, Vermont, as well as New York City. Um, and interestingly, Chicago and San Francisco have allowed non-citizens to participate in school board elections as well. So recognizing this flexibility and, and constant change of the American electorate, I went back to my initial research question and slightly modified. Should immigrants be allowed to vote again in the United States? And to answer that question, I came up with a new theory to determine who constitutes the people of the United States from an electoral perspective. I call it the sufficient connection theory. And this novel theory argues that the demos of a democracy is composed by all the members of the community who can prove sufficient connections with their place of residence. In other words, the sufficient connection theory suggests that regardless of the citizenship, any person with enough roots in the place where they live should be allowed to vote and hold office. So before I, before I explain in full detail how the sufficient connection theory works. It is, it is fundamental, it is critical to understand uh, that the democratic system of the United States is divided into six electoral jurisdictions. Electors in the United States, voters in the United States uh, may vote in federal elections, state elections, city or town elections, village elections, and district elections. And unless you think otherwise, it does not seem legally justifiable to restrict the right of suffrage of show six in most of these electoral jurisdictions, uh, based on their, on, just simply based on their lack of American citizenship. So the sufficient connection theory proposes a, a novel solution to identify who should be allowed to vote. Because it is my firm belief that show six uh, should be allowed to vote in some of these selections, as long as they have sufficient connections with their place of residence. Uh, to prove the voters sufficient roots in their place of residence, I proposed a reasonability test based on this equation that you see on your screen. Uh, it is, a, it is a, an equation that is founded on the six electoral jurisdictions and an extensive point chart of connection between a show sick and its place of residence. That includes driver's license, bank accounts, electric bills, college ID, uh, tax return, you name it, et cetera. And according to this reasonability test, a show sick needs to demonstrate five connection points to vote in district elections, 10 points for village elections, 15 points for town and city elections, 20 points for, for county elections, 25 points for state elections, and 30 points to vote in federal elections. So I want to conclude with a remark inspired by Ali Norani, who is my boss, and honestly, one of the most uh, inspiring and smartest immigration advocates that I know. Um, because it is understandable to feel nervous or uncomfortable when the neighborhood where you live starts feeling with people from different countries, uh, people who pray differently, eat differently, uh, love differently. It's normal if, you for, if your first reaction is skepticism toward, towards granting the right to vote to your show sick neighbors. Uh, so regardless of your position, I want to ask all of you a favor. First, if you are a show sick and you live in the United States or wherever you live, I need you to engage more in your community. Introduce yourself to your American neighbors. Uh, become more politically active. Uh, don't be indifferent to the injustices around you. Become community leaders. Read the local newspaper. Give a fresh new voice to your, to, to your neighborhood where you live. And if you are an American citizen, I want you to talk please with your, with your show sick neighbors um, and learn more about them. You'll see that despite the differences 
of language and religion, we all share the same core values. So please, I am leaving you with homework uh, to, to all of you to grab a beer with your show sick or American neighbors, watch a soccer game together. Um, and let's work, let's work hard to create um, the best version of this country. I, um, as, a, as most show sick who live in the United States, I, I really love this country. And I work tirelessly um, hoping that one day this country will love me or will love us back. And the, photo, the photograph that you're seeing in your screen is a photo of, of what America should look like. People from all over the world enjoying and sharing a table to enjoy a meal. So thank you, Laura and Derek, for being the best representatives of, of this country. And uh, thank you all for sharing with me these amazing 30 minutes. And feel free to reach out whenever you want with questions, suggestions, and even to fight my ideas back. Uh, so you guys are amazing and go be great. Excellent. Thank you, Arturo. Um, we have about uh, 10 or so minutes for questions, and that was fantastic. Uh, great presentation. My, my father was actually a, a show sick from Colombia, and he spent 13 months in Korea fighting for the United States as a show sick. So, um, you know, one question is if he's allowed to fight and lose his life for the country, should he be allowed to vote for the country? Um, a <clears throat> um, couple questions from, uh, from, from the audience. Why do show six not become citizens? What holds them back? Interesting question. And that's uh, one of the things that we face constantly when we advocate for the value of immigrants to the nation. Um, some people have the, the wrong impression that requesting, a, requesting the citizenship uh, of these countries is CC that we have to get in line, uh, but it's not, it's not that simple. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. And some of us who have been living here, uh, I, we've been here for six years already, we don't have a clear pathway to citizenship, not even a clear pathway, we don't have a pathway to citizenship. So we won't be able to vote in the United States, um, at least not in federal elections for the remainder of time. So it's, it's complicated, right? <coughs> Uh, and I'm not saying that all show six should get the citizenship because they should get a, a citizenship if they want to participate in federal elections and to be part, part of, the, of the American community, right? But if they want to be uh, strong advocates within their communities, within their municipalities, there is no need to become uh, a, a citizen of the places where they live. Uh, to become representatives of, of, of their town, of their communities. So uh, unfortunately, the, the last major immigration reform in the United States happened in 1986. It was a cold era war. A lot of things have changed, including the, the geopolitics of the world, as you can imagine. Um, so, the, so we urgently need a, an immigration reform to to, to better reflect the needs of, our, of, of the United States, to attract more immigrants, to make America more competitive against uh, other global <coughs> competitors. So hopefully many more will have a pathway to citizenship to fight or work or take care of Americans while they're here. Yeah. So um, one thing I want to uh, kind of get your thoughts on is that one of the things I, I just really enjoyed about being um, watching you in your research as you did it um, at its core. And this will be kind of a longish question with a punctuated question at the end. At, at its core, you were, you were in many ways just challenging a single distinction, one that many would think would be kind of simple. Um, yet in order to do that, you needed to take an an, an untold number of perspectives, challenge a cascade of following distinctions, look at many systems and subsystems and how they connect, which in your 30 minute talk, you shared just the, the surface of. Um, zoom into a bunch of different incredibly important and technical relationships. And in a sense, in order to make a single distinction of whether or not somebody votes or doesn't vote, or uh, you had to do an awful lot of DSRPing in, in a very complex way. 
And I also love that through your analysis, you changed your mind. That that the the, the thing that you started with, you didn't you didn't go to the totally opposite side, but you 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 ended up with a very nuanced understanding. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, how can we help raise people in your process to from childhood, let's say, who are able to pause and think more deeply before they have sort of knee jerk reactions and arrive at preconceived conclusions, but they actually take the time to sort of explore and be open and, um, and not assume, and, and, and sort of when they look into a single distinction, know almost beforehand that it's going to explode into complexity. What do you think, just share your thoughts on that because watching you was, uh, was really profound. Well, thank you, Derek. And I think if, if, if I can have a, a definite answer for that, I will get a Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> uh, because it's, it's, it, it, that will help solve many of the problems of the world. Uh, listen, the most fascinating thing that I found during my research is that I had always been doing DSR, DSRP without even knowing it existed, right? Um, but when I started using it more consciously, I was able to become more persuasive, thoughtful, and more thorough. And to be honest, as you said, I started my research as an activist. I was wearing my activist cap, uh, who, who was upset with the political arena of 2017. I was, I was angry. And that trip to Kern County that I talked about left me feeling uneasy and angry about the situation of, of my compatriots who were there. And I was having trouble to accept and understand the opinions that were opposite to mine. So before I started writing my dissertation, I thought that immigrants without a doubt should be allowed to vote, right? I was not taking into consideration all the unintended consequences of fully enfranchising millions of show six from one day to another. Um, but when I started taking your class and I learned about systems thinking, that allowed me to provide um, a more nuanced understanding of the world. Uh, to be honest, the SRP was a very helpful tool to narrow the scope of my dissertation and lay an effective plan for the research. Um, I applied the SRP throughout my thesis in a variety of ways. For instance, the SRP facilitated the identification of all the exhaustive distinctions in the American electoral system. Um, and once I had identified those distinctions, that allowed me to understand the relationships that exist among all the elements uh, in, in, in American democracy. And after highlighting all those relationships, I was able, able to appreciate, right, the complexity and evolution of the American electoral system as a whole. And as soon as I defined and narrowed the electoral system of the United States, I was able to analyze the multiple perspectives on Shosik enfranchisement. And I think particularly that is what enriched my, my, my work. And perhaps that's what best answers your question. So. Uh, my suggestions to everyone out there, regardless of the kind of work that you're doing, whether you are um, a doctor, a, a politician, policymaker, a lawyer, always uh, try to walk the shoes of others and try to be more sympathetic uh, and understand where their views are coming from. Because <clears throat> we all want to have a better world, but we have different approaches to achieve that world. But if we start listening to each other and and, and chatting respectfully, I think we have a, a better chance to, to improve the world. Yeah, amazing that we, you know, you're a lawyer. Uh, we just had a, a, a Silicon Valley executive say almost the exact same thing <laughs> about the, just the importance of listening, taking perspective, that kind of thing. So we see that, you know, when we take perspective, we're not just taking our our perspective of somebody else's perspective. We're actually trying to, uh, you know, empathize with what, where they're coming from and what their concerns are. And, and I watched you do that. And, and, you know, Daisy Hernandez from Zora just, just said, that's like the core advice that she would give uh, it to, to up and coming uh, entrepreneurs. So, so important. We have a couple audience questions. Um, how do you think the inherently political process of redistricting 
might impact the goals of expanding the electric? Listen, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in gerrymandering, but let me tell you, going back to my experience in Kern County, California, uh, the districts were designed in order to, to, to favor Republican candidates. Because even though the, the majority of the population in, Bakers, in Bakersfield, California, which is part of, of Kern County, was mainly Hispanic, the districts were designed in a way that um, mainly the, the, the higher economical class of the county could vote for their respective and preferred candidates. So it's the, 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 the electoral challenges of the United States and from many countries in the world are multiple and varied. Um, but the important thing is to recognize that all these districts, regardless of how they are designed, all of them, or almost all of them, have show six that are, are not being able to voice their concerns. And for that reason, they are easy scapegoats or political, of political candidates who, who call us criminals or who call us dangerous or who call us uh, as people who are here just to use public services without paying nothing at all, which that's, that's not true. And, um, and, and the relevance of show six in this country is becoming more evident than ever. And as I like to say, uh, we, we must start seeing, and I say us because I consider myself as a member of, of the American community, we must start seeing show six as part of the solution, not the problem. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I love that your uh, the, the sufficient connection theory in, in many ways gives agent-based advice on the kinds of things you should be doing to bring about the connectivity um, that that would that would eventually be justification for something like that. Um. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's an uphill battle, and and I don't call, I don't want to call it a battle. Uh, you know, as a systems thinker, it's important to 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 make difficult questions about the country that we want and how we move forward. So, I'm a fervent believer that we must ask these questions. And whether it is time or not to grant the right to vote to non-citizens, to show six, it's important to ask these questions and to see where we want to go as a country. Um, and as, you, as, as Darwin would say, and, and you would, I'm sure, would, would agree, uh, it's survival of the fittest. So we must evolve and adapt to the circumstances of our times. And um, so, yeah, that's why we're here as scholars to ask these difficult questions. Yeah. Another question from the audience. My question is, what needs to be changed for us to expand voting rights to show six? A constitutional amendment for federal elections, just a city bill is enough for local elections. What can we do? Great question. Uh, it depends on the electoral jurisdiction where you want show six to participate. Uh, some states like Maryland uh, allows, show six, allows municipalities to to make reforms to their municipal charters. So a, a simple reform to the municipal charter in Maryland would allow show six to participate. Uh, actually in the county where I live, uh, uh, in, in the town, I'm sorry, Chevy Chase, Maryland, show six have been allowed, have been able to vote for the last 10 years at least. So we can change it through legislative reforms. We can challenge it in courts. Um, we can, uh, organize protests and demonstrations. But the most important thing is, is what I said at the end of my presentation in, in my perspective. We must start talking to each other, understanding why we want to vote. Because even if there is a right to vote and we don't take advantage of that, it doesn't matter. We have to engage in our communities more as show six. And hopefully uh, American citizens who are listening to this presentation will engage more and, under, and try to understand more about where their show six neighbor, neighbors are coming from. Great stuff, Arturo. Uh, thank you so much. We're unfortunately out of time, uh, but uh, it, how can people um, follow up with uh, your work? I would be happy to stay in touch with all of you. My name is Arturo Castellanos Canales. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one on Facebook with that name. <laughs> okay. uh, and you can find me at my Cornell account, AC2629 at cornell.edu. Uh, 
then happy to stay in touch and congratulations everyone thank you